I'm going to talk to you a little bit about relapses and multiple sclerosis. Now, this isn't obviously applicable universally across everybody's multiple sclerosis because we know that a proportion of people with multiple sclerosis present without necessarily any relapses. They have progressive MS. Some people call it primary progressive MS. Can we have some quiet? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. So some people don't always, or some people just don't have relapses. They have progressive MS, and we call that primary progressive MS. It's actually quite a small percentage of the population. We think it's probably 10% or more, probably still less than that, actually. So most of you with MS would have had a relapse, either as a sentinel relapse right at the outset of the disease and possibly <coughs> progressed, or relapsing remitting MS, which is the typical pattern, which represents about 65 to 75% of multiple sclerosis. But we also know that people with relapsing MS have a risk of developing progressive MS subsequently. So what is it about relapses? Can we understand something about relapses that might give us a handle on what's going on in the longer phases of MS? So that's what I thought I'd briefly talk to you about. Some of this will be science, but I'll try and be as explanatory as I can. And some of it will be clinically relevant to each and one, each an individual one of you. So this is the very simplified version of what Professor Chandran was telling you about what we all, all are in our brain. Impulses. We're all a bunch of nerve impulses, basically. Electrical activity, sometimes neurochemical activity going on. And it's the synchrony of this activity that leads to patterns that we do, you know, in terms of our brain function. But fundamentally, it comes down to this. And this was so important that the person that actually described the action potential, impulse propagation, won the Nobel Prize back in the 1960s when it was first described, in, originally on the squid axon. You might ask, why the squid axon? Because the squid, you know, the big squid, the giant squid, had the largest single axon of any animal that we know of. So before technology and micro, you know, um, or the molecular biology, they had to rely on macro things, and they, they studied the squid axon, and that's where the action potential was studied. So this is a very important part of neurosciences per se. So I haven't put the cell body in there, which is the nerve body, but effectively that's the axon or the nerve fiber, which you recognize. And around the nerve fiber, you've got this insulation called the myelin sheath. All of you who are patients with MS have heard the word demyelination all the time. We, re we, we use it interchangeably with multiple sclerosis, so you know what it is. Okay? Demyelination means that due to the immune system, you get stripping of the myelin sheath away from the axon, and that has various repercussions, which Professor Chandran mentioned to you. And I'm going to show you in a schematic cartoon in a second. But the principle is that if the electrical signal had to go along the axon from here, left of the screen to right on the, on the right side of the screen, then it would take time A, okay, X, whatever you want to call it. But there's no doubt that that propagation of impulse is much slower than the nerve impulse jumping between these internodes. Forget the K and the, sodium, uh, and the Na, that's to do with sodium channels and potassium channels, but... So the nodes of Ranvier, basically, is where the action potential jumps from point, from this point to that point, from that point to that point, and so on. This is a much faster form of conduction, between 60 and 80 meters per second, than going along there, which is more like 20 to 25 meters per second. In other words, it is two to three times faster to do that than to do that. All right? And that's an important concept. And that is the underlying concept of neurological deficits and demyelination. The reason you get a symptom, the reason you might get optic neuritis, the reason you might get a weak leg, the reason you might you get a numbness in a hand or double vision is because your brain is generating an impulse, but the impulse is taking too long to get from point A to point B. In fact, on occasion, it might dissipate and never get from point A to point B, a bit like network rail. You, know, you start off on the train, from London to Edinburgh, and it stops in Nottingham and never actually gets to Edinburgh. That sort of uh, situation. So that's what's going on, and this is the underlying principle for why you get neurological symptoms. 
And it's also the underlying principle why some of you get what we call paroxysmal symptoms. What we mean by that is short-lived changes in your neurological function in a particular part of your nervous system. So when we talk about this condition called UTOS phenomena, and you've heard me talk about it, the reason you get UTOS phenomena is because in a normal person with normal myelin, no matter how hot or cold it gets, your nerve impulses go from point A to point B because you've got enough conduction, 60 meters per second, for it not to matter. But by the time your impulse propagation has gone down to 20 meters per second, then the ambient temperature affects the speed of conduction. Okay? So if you've got critical conduction, say at 25 meters per second, and your temperature, your external temperature, or your body temperature goes up by even half a degree, like say you've got a temperature, you've got a cold or the flu, or it's a hot day, or you've been doing exercise, or you're in a hot bath, or you're having a hot shower, whatever, that 0.5 degree centigrade change in your ambient temperature can have, can double or halve, basically, your impulse propagation, and that can cause you to have symptoms. It doesn't mean you've got more inflammation, doesn't mean you're having a relapse, it just means that the conduction has been affected transiently during that time. It's an important concept. Does that all make sense? Any questions? Because this really is part of the discussion that we have in clinics. You know, Dr. Malik, you know, last month I had a really bad month because it was 32 degrees, which is unusual in England, you know, but if you're going to hot climate, it can happen. So that's an important concept. So it's all to do with impulse propagation. This is the underlying basis on which all these symptoms occur. Okay? So moving on from that, that's the schematic. We're now going to go on to a cartoon. This was a cartoon that was drawn by some medical students at Imperial a couple of years ago during teaching. It's now become so popular that it's gone to national press now, actually, and it was published in the JNMP. So this is, if you like, a schematic of what happens in MS. So I'm just going to talk you through it a little bit. It's called the attack of the demyelinator. There he is there, the little rogue. Okay, he's covered up there. And this deals with the concept of what I was just talking about, impulse propagation. Curses. At this rate, it's going to take me twice as long to cross the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is one of the pathways, basically, in the brain. So this sort of sums it up. So there's all the myelinated fiber, there's the myelinated fiber, and there you've got the area of demyelination. This guy is trying to get across. So he can run across here, but with this abnormal bridge, he's having problems running across, so he's slowed down. That's the action potential man. He's the AP, the action potential man. This is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek comment about Detective McDonald. Why is that relevant? I'm sure you've heard me talk about the McDonald criteria for multiple sclerosis, haven't you? Named after Ian McDonald, who was a neurologist who originally described the MRI criteria for MS. So the detective was trying to solve the case of demyelination is Detective McDonald, which is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek comment. But the fact of the matter is that you get slowing down of the pro propagation of the impulse. You can get symptoms, basically, for example, have you had symptoms before? My mate on the optic nerve had trouble with this terrorist a few months ago. So even though you might come to see us in clinic with a weak leg, when we're going through the symptomatology, you might, many of you actually in the past, have reported the fact, oh yeah, two or three years ago I had some difficulty with my vision. Now I went to a certain hospital and they said I had optoneuritis or maybe they didn't even give it a name. They just had some inflammation in the nerve and it settled down and it got better or you had some steroids. So not infrequently we find a retrospective history of people with optic neuritis, which is not unusual. So that's the sort of thing that sort of happens really. This is nystagmus, which we're going to ignore. This is the one that really caught my fancy actually last night. I was showing this to my wife, who has very limited knowledge of multiple sclerosis, in spite of being with me for 24 years. Um, I hope we don't have one of those awful boy bands in the CSF again. So you've heard us talk about the oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid. I thought this was quite a good little comment there, actually. CSF, oligoclonal bands, basically. That's what this is about. So this is a schematic of what's going on. It's a very interesting way of presenting it. And this is a sort of the next phase of the cartoon. So Detective McDonald you know, takes a dive and comes up with the boys doing their singing. They're the demyelinated fiber, and we need to bring in the PREDS. That's the prednisolone, which we often use for the treatment of the acute relapses. I thought that was very, very good. So anyway, so this was the cartoon to get us discussing and to get us talking, really. 
So are there any questions about that? Before I move on a little bit more, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the pathology of MS and what we're doing in terms of the correlation with MRIs. Any questions? You're all too informed. Yes, ma'am. If you just hang on a second, ma'am, we're just going to get Lelina. I've sort of usurped her. She wasn't expecting me to take questions this early. It was just one small question sure. about the heat and the effect of the heat on symptoms. Yep. Um, one of the nurses I went to recently, she said that the humidity, particularly in this country, is, is a nightmare for symptoms. Yeah, as opposed and to dry heat, yeah. That's right. She suggested I move to Italy, which I'd love to do, but unfortunately I can't. Um, Should we prescribe that then to the NHS? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, I just wondered why the humidity as well as the heat, really. I don't actually know. I can only imagine that uh, the humidity somehow contributes more to your ambient body temperature going up. Because at the end of the day, it's not the actual external heat that matters because your nerves are inside your head and there's a lot of insulation, skin, skull, and so on to get in there. It's more the ambient body temperature that actually matters, really, which is why exercise is actually a very potent stimulant, actually, of UTOS phenomena. And not infrequently, I've diagnosed patients over many, many years with MS who actually report exactly that. They start to get blurring of vision when they're on the treadmill or on the exercise bike. That's their first presentation of their MS, basically, is the UTOS phenomena. So it's not infrequent. Right, so what are we going to talk about now? This is a schematic that you've seen lots and lots of times before, but it, it's sort of a slightly more detailed one, really, uh, than what Siddharthan was showing earlier. So the clinical course of MS, you, we've discussed it, you know about it, but it's just to give you a sort of an idea. So what happens here is that you have a clinical relapse or an acute relapse, whatever you want to call it, essentially, and it's a discrete episode or a change in neurological function. I deliberately haven't written down an actual definition of what an acute relapse is. It's in the books, it's in various websites, because nobody's actually agreed it. Nobody has actually got a universal definition of what a relapse is. But essentially, what we, we use as the working definition of a relapse is neurological dysfunction or a change in neurological status lasting for 24 hours or more, basically, in the context of demyelination. That's the sort of the broad working definition, which means if you are hot for a few hours because you've done some exercise and your symptoms last for two or three hours, that's excluded from our definition of acute relapse. So if you get, rela if you get symptoms like atonic spasms or some sort of L other thing that lasts for a minute or two minutes or six minutes or even 60 minutes, we don't really consider that a relapse. We don't think it is a relapse basically. So I think 24 hours is a reasonable cutoff that we've established as the definition of a relapse. So that's what happens. So when I talk about a clinical relapse, I'm talking about something that's happened that's 24 hours or more, effectively, for that, okay? So you might have a relapse, you might have another relapse, you might have a more severe relapse, and the duration of time that each relapse lasts is variable. Might last 48 hours, might last 48 days. Who knows? You know, it's very, very difficult to know. Okay? And then you reach this intermediate phase of relapsing MS where you might start to accumulate some disability or deficits. In other words, they don't completely go away, basically. And some of you are aware of that. Others of you are not aware of that, which is a good thing. And then you may reach this point, which is the bit that Siddhartha concentrated on, which is where we've got no real treatment and you're in a progressive phase of MS and we haven't really got any therapies. We're looking for them. We're trying to find strategies of dealing with it. This is where you're dealing more with the symptomatic phase of the disease, essentially. But underlying these relapses, we are gleaning more and more information from MRI, basically, which was really where it all started. So the red line is a brain volume, which I'm going to come back to. But clinical threshold is this dotted line here. So for every relapse that you do have, there are MRI relapsing activity going on not infrequently. And I'm sure you're aware of that. So MRI is more sensitive than your clinical episodes in terms of picking up activity, inflammatory activity within the brain and the spinal cord. Okay? And it's this that cumulatively will lead to disability in some patients. So you probably heard us say, both Richard and I and others, about how important the MRI stability is for us to be able to say, well, actually, your MS is stable, okay? 
Clinical stability is important, don't get me wrong. And at the end of the day, day to day, clinical stability is what impacts on your lives, what you can and can't do on a day to day basis. But an MRI is a very important component of it. But you can't be doing MRIs every month to look for the next lesion that's going to come along because that's not a practical way of living. You know, that's not a good way of living. But to have an MRI scan once a year is not that onerous. You know, it's not that impacting and gives us a view as to whether the Galenia is working, whether the Rebus is working, whether the Tysabri, well, we have more frequent Tysabri scans and so on, but that gives you an idea of what's going on. So for each of these inflammatory episodes that are going on radiologically, you're accumulating a lesion, what we call these T2 lesions, these white blobs that you've seen on the scan. And if you keep seeing more and more white blobs occurring, then we know in the long run, over a 10, 15, 20, 30 year period, that has a very strong correlation with disability at the end of the day. But I have to tell you, as with everything in the world, there are exceptions. I have patients whose whole brain is just covered in white blobs and they are completely fine 40 years after they had the start of their MS. Now, what is it about those people, right, that makes them different to some of you who've got disability with much less in the way of lesion load? And that's what it's going to, I'm going to talk about a little bit about some of the pathology of MS because that's really what it's about, okay, some of it. So does that all make sense? So frequent relapsing activity in the early phase of the disease. Ideally, we want to catch you here on the MS side. If we can switch off all these yellow bars and we can switch off these green bars, we might shift the whole curve that way. In other words, the brain volume, as it starts to shrink, because you're losing the nerve cells, exactly the thing that Professor Chandran was talking about, you're losing axons. If we can keep this red line flat or make it flatter, then we would have achieved something. And what we're doing is we're delaying that phase of the disease off the, off the chart over there. So that's what we're trying to do. That's the ideal, really. Okay? So that's what we're trying to get to. Does that all make sense? Good. Okay. I'm sorry, if I'm being too simple, then let me know. I'll go on a bit faster. So these are the sorts of things that, ha that uh, Siddhartha showed some pictures of pathological tissue uh, of patients with multiple sclerosis, but this is just my own sort of schematic, really. So what you've got is two different types of lesions, okay? You've got the demyelinated... Th so this should all be blue. This is the white matter of the brain. Outside in the pinky area, the grey matter of the brain, where you've still got oligodendrocytes and nerve fibers, because you have to. You haven't just got pure nerve cell bodies in the gray matter. You have to have communication from those. So there is myelin in the gray matter, but there's less of it. So the volume of it proportionately is less. So you still have it. But most of it lies in the white matter. It should be this dark blue color. And these white blobs here and here and here are the demyelinating plaques. This is the correlation, and I'll show you in a second, of what we see on your MRI scan. So this is the T2 lesion that you see on an MRI scan. These are the blobs that you see. Okay? There are some solid arrows here, which I'm going to come back to later, and they're relevant. And these are sort of remyelinating things that Siddhartha was talking about, and I'll come back to that later on. This is a different type of slide, which just talks about... This, this is basically to do with myelin content and intermediate myelin content, which I won't really talk about. But these are the sorts of pictures that I really wanted you to get a feel for. So this is supposed to be an education program, and hopefully you'll be educated by the end of it. So this is a patient with multiple sclerosis who has got an, ac ac who's got an acute relapse, okay? And this is the sort of thing that you see, a gadolinium-enhancing lesion. So if you remember what gadolinium is, it's the contrast that we inject what that tells us is the fact that this is a brand new lesion, okay? Couldn't have been there before because if you get a lesion in MS, it only enhances the gadolinium for between two and four weeks. After that, it goes quiescent. It doesn't enhance again unless you have another attack within the same lesion, which can happen but is unusual, okay? So this is a brand new lesion. You've got gadolinium enhancement. Gadolinium enhancement is a marker of breakdown of blood-brain barrier, Okay. I don't know if you've heard of the concept of the blood-brain barrier, but effectively the brain is separated from the rest of your body and the blood that circulates within it because the brain is an incredibly, well, exquisitely sensitive organ to any changes that are going on peripherally. So if you've eaten and you've had a very, very large glucose meal or a fatty meal, the brain doesn't need to change its function in relation to what's going on externally. If you're, if you're a bit dehydrated and your sodium and potassium are at different levels peripherally, 
your brain doesn't need to be exposed to that, otherwise it won't work properly. So there is this blood-brain barrier, which basically separates it, a bit like the White House, and a bit like Downing Street, are separated from the rest of the United Kingdom. You know, they live in their own sort of stratosphere, really. You know. So they need to be separated because they, ha they have a function that's beyond just the normal minute-by-minute -minute variation. Five minutes. Oh, God, I better go quicker. Okay, so that's the blood-brain barrier. Okay, and the breakdown of blood-brain barrier causes the gadolinium enhancement. The pathological correlate of that is this is a blood vessel here, and what you can see, indicated by I, are the inflammatory cells that have leaked out of the blood vessel and are lying now within the brain substance. The blue is the myelin, so that's normal myelin, and you can see the myelin is beginning to break down where these inflammatory cells are. Okay, so we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail. You then reach an intermediate phase where the gadolinium enhancement starts to go down, it's disappearing, and what you've got left is, this is normal, this is a different color, but this is normal myelin here. This is a demyelinated plaque. These blue nuclei are the cells that have been left. They're the astrocytes. The oligodendrocytes have been killed, destroyed. Myelin's been stripped off the axon. And this is the residual myelin that's left. So the red stain here are myelin products, okay? Because the inflammatory cells have gone in, they've attacked the myelin and the axon, they've stripped it off, and this is what's left. These are byproducts, basically. Collateral damage, or maybe even primary damage, basically, from the inflammatory process. What are you left with then? You then get left with, on the MRI scan, you get these white plaques, these are the T2 lesions, and that's a typical demyelinated plaque around a blood vessel, almost always a vein. So what you get what's called perivenular inflammation, okay? So you get veins where the inflammation originally was, and you've got left now this demyelinated plaque. That's the T2 lesion. That's what you see on the MRI scan. Now, whatever function the nerve fibers within this lesion, or the ones traversing it, were doing, are now conducting only at 20 meters per second, as opposed to the 60 meters per second that they would normally do. Now, it could be that 20 meters per second is perfectly adequate for you to feel no symptoms at all. In other words, it is having no demonstrable effect on your day-to-day -day life, which is often the case. So we, genu we genuinely see people with lots of T2 lesions, like this, who don't have symptoms attributable to dysfunction in that area. That's because the axons that are traversing this are compensating. Okay, because they are doing that. But if you keep accumulating these things over a long period of time, that compensatory mechanism goes. And that's when you start to get the disability and the dysfunction, because they can't compensate anymore. Does that make sense? So that's where we have the problems. So just to demonstrate the fact that the previous slide is not the only outcome from a demyelinated plaque, it's very important to know that you have, there is a second outcome that can occur. You're not then left with a permanently demyelinated plaque in every circumstance. You then go to a situation where you can get remyelination. So this is a scan of somebody who had a problem attributable specifically to this lesion causing speech problem because in her dominant hemisphere in her speech area she had difficulty with expressive speech. There's the lesion there in 2009 just happened to go onto Tysabri. And this is in 2012, three years later, where that lesion has completely remyelinated. So demonstrably, you can't show the lesion anymore. It's now go, gone back to being that dark gray color, which is the color of the normal myelin. Okay? So this, interestingly, this person's speech problem also improved during that period. But interestingly, their speech problem improved a lot faster than the myelin did. The speech problem improved within a few months, but the resolution of the MRI took years to two or three years. It's still possible that this person might have another attack which will affect that area again. You know, you just don't know. It's erratic. And this is demonstrable here and here on a slightly different sequence. What I would like you to see is the fact that during that time, in that three-year period, although that lesion got better, they did accumulate a new lesion there. So that's important to see is the fact that that lesion was not there in 2009 but is now. So even if you're on Tysabri, although we're trying to stop any new lesions from forming, 
We're not always successful at stopping all new lesions. But on the balance of probability that the patient is stable and the lesion accumulation is small enough, then we accept that because we'd like to have something that works 100%, but we don't. The Tysabri is okay at the moment. So I just wanted to introduce the concept of remyelination. So I showed you earlier these open arrows. So these are areas where you've got remyelination. So if you can see, they have that intermediate lightish blue color. The reason is, is that when you first myelinate your nerve fibers between the ages of about six months and about two years after you're born, that's when most of myelination occurs, you basically get a particular type of myelin called compact myelin with a certain thickness. When you remyelinate, in other words, the reparative uh, aspect of myelination, you never get a thicker myelin sheath and you, never get, and you tend to get shorter nodes of Ranvier, okay? So if you can imagine when I showed you the original slide, the longer the nodes of Ranvier, the more the impulse can jump. In other words, the faster it is. So the shorter nodes of Ranvier and the thinner myelin means it's not as efficient as the original myelin that you had. And that's an important concept too. So repair is good, but it's not as good as the original. Okay? So that's the concept of remyelination. And this is what it looks like, basically, in, my, in, in microscopy. So that, you'll have to believe me when I say that that's a normal bit of myelin there. That's a thick myelin. And this is a thinner myelin. Basically, that's what it looks like. I mean, that's in a bit more detail. But that's a, quite a good example of it. So that is a thinner than normal myelin around an axon. Okay? And this is what it looks like in the test tube. This is actually the wrong way around. But that's the oligodendrocyte there, which you know is a myelinating cell in the brain, spinal cord, and the optic nerve. And this is how it ensheets an axon. And this is in the test tube. So this picture was taken when Siddharthan and I were both in Cambridge doing our first lots of bits of research about remyelination, basically. So this was very, very innovative in 1995, 1996, you know, about 18 years ago. I'm aging myself, but, you know, but there we go. So that's when it was. Um, but since then, the world of glial biology and the stem cell research has gone through the stratosphere, really. And, and, and Siddhartha, I thought, gave a really good talk and bringing you up to date with where we're at with that. Um, so in terms of treatment of a relapse, most of you have been through this, but really the world of relapse management hasn't really moved on much in the last 40 years, I'd say, or even 50 years. But we were using derivatives of steroids back in the 1960s, basically, for the treatment of relapses. So this was a trial, and this is still the seminal trial. It's the Cochrane Review of Oral versus Intravenous Steroids for Treatment of RRMS, for Relapses in MS, published about two years ago. Author's conclusions were the analysis of the five meta-analysis, uh, the meta-analysis of five trials that were done basically showed that there was no significant, statistically significant difference between intravenous steroids and oral steroids, basically, high-dose oral. So theoretically, we shouldn't really be giving you IV steroids, but our anecdotal view is that we think that IV steroids probably work slightly faster, more potently in the short term. So if you're having a bad relapse and it's bad enough for you to contact us to want to do something about it, we tend to give you IV, and if we need be, for other circumstances, we might give you oral. So that's the rationale of it, if you like. There's not much to choose between them. And the sort of regimes that you've seen, intravenous regimes, we give methylprednisolone for three days or half a gram for five days. Oral doses include methylprednisolone, half a gram for five days, or prednisolone, 60 milligrams a day. I wouldn't want you to go away thinking that steroids can be used with impunity, really, because it's important for you to remember that even though we tend to dish them out like they're going out of fashion because of the numbers of patients that we see, at the end of the day, we're always cognizant of the fact that there are short-term and long-term side effects of steroids. So glycemic control in people who have a tendency to diabetes, delayed wound healing, skin disorders, particularly easy bruising, and infections. All this, short-term side effects of steroids. Longer term, we worry about hypertension, fatty disorders like hypercholesterolemia, osteoporosis is a big issue, particularly since we're treating people, women often, young, premenopausal, and then if you give them steroids when they're premenopausal, postmenopausal, they lose bone density, it's a big problem, and osteoporotic fractures is an issue. Cataracts, not infrequently, weight gain, and avascular necrosis of femoral head. I 
No, there's no wood here. Okay, I'm standing on wood. I've never had a case of this so far, and I'm hoping I never will, basically. But effectively, it's a, long t it's a complication of steroids where you get severe osteoarthritis in your hip or can do, essentially. Okay, so that's really all I had to say. So just to tell you that I should have been at the Ryder Cup, really, because Captain McGinley did invite me, but you must be a very special audience for me to be down here rather than up, at, up in Perthshire. Okay. <laughs> There you go. And this is me playing golf, and then in my spare time, I occasionally write a book in my spare time. Mostly on the golf course, though, I have to tell you. Okay. Right. Thank you. That was all I wanted to say, really. Are there any questions? You've got a question there, Lane. Thank you. They know got a gentleman sure. in the blue jumper as well. You showed a picture of uh, somebody who'd shown some uh, form of recovery around her speech. So I was just wondering what treatment uh, she was being given at that time. So, so in her specific case, her relapse happened in the context of her being on existing injections for the interferon. So effectively, right. if you like, she was failing interferon. So we switched her over. So she had the steroids in the first instance, as I mentioned. And right. then she was started on this drug, the... The, the drug that Richard Nicholas was talking about, Ty Sabri. So she was on that for two or three years, and she made a gradual recovery. Right. And that's the scan that you saw three years down the line. Oh, that's excellent. So uh, the, really, the premise of remyelination really is about stopping or retarding inflammation. You're not going to get repair or remyelination unless you get a handle on the ongoing inflammation. That's the fundamental principle. So that's why the focus very much on the early phases of MS is to try and arrest the inflammation or to certainly to ameliorate it to allow the body a chance to repair. So that's what we try and work on. Uh, is there time for one more very quick question, Go on. just whether you know it or not? Uh, there's uh, some work being done in New Zealand, I think, and I can't remember the name of the doctor, but I think her first name was Anne something or other. And she's reported some really good uh, work that's been done with progressive MS. And I just wondered whether, and it was about switching on and off the autoimmune response. Yeah. So it's actually being done in lots of places. And a lot of people are looking at autoimmune vaccination as a potential you know, treatment for MS. In other words, taking the lymphocytes that we think drive the inflammation and re-educating them by exposing them to certain types of chemicals and modifications. Our problem in MS often is, is that, yes, we'd like to be able to, to have this autoantigen vaccination. We don't actually know what the autoantigen is. So we don't know what it is that the immune system is actually directed against in the first instance. If we knew that, if you like, the chemical or the protein, then we would work on that specifically. But hitherto, we've never identified the autoantigen. So it makes that vaccination process very difficult. There was a gentleman that had a question there with the blue jumper. And then this lady. Sorry, just to follow up exactly that, uh, Bristol University published some research precisely on that uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, where they appear to think that they have identified what the antigen is. Do you have any confidence in, in that particular no, because approach? No, every, because every year or two, somebody has identified what they think the autoantigen in MS is, and unfortunately, we've been universally disappointed. So I think even if somebody identifies one and says, this is the holy grail, I don't think all other research should stop at this point. I think there has to be a moratorium on it. So I don't think that that's been validated enough for us to be able to say that that's, that's the magic bullet at the moment. But, you know, there was one other question for this lady with the glasses, and we'll stop at that point, I think. Can exercise um, trigger a relapse? Not that we know of. No. no. So exercise can exacerbate that UTOS phenomenon that I was mentioning in the beginning obviously, but we don't think exercise has any negative impact on MS. Thank you very much. So 